Hello, I'm Dr. David Boyd, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. In the past 12 years, the United Nations has recognized through pioneering resolutions some very fundamental human rights. In 2010, both the United Nations Human Rights Council and the General Assembly recognized the human rights to water and sanitation. And in 2021, the Human Rights Council recognized the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, which was confirmed by the General Assembly in July of 2022. It's fundamentally important to have these rights not only recognized by the United, by the United Nations, but also incorporated into the regional and domestic legal systems. And this is because human rights have transformative potential to really change our societies and to catalyze action and enable people to hold governments accountable to their commitments. But this requires the, the rights to be recognized. And so we've seen over the course of the past 12 years, the impacts of recognizing the rights to water and sanitation. We've seen countries uh, as diverse as Costa Rica, Fiji, Mexico, and Tunisia uh, add these rights to their constitutions. We've seen countries change their legislation to protect the rights to water and sanitation. And most importantly, we've seen countries increase the priority given to fulfilling these fundamental human rights for people who are often in vulnerable situations. And the great hope is that the recent recognition by the UN of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment will have a similar impact at the constitutional legislative levels and most importantly, improving people's quality of lives. There is a global water crisis. You know, people often talk about the triple planetary crisis of the climate emergency, the collapse of biodiversity, and pervasive toxic pollution. But I would argue that there's a fourth crisis, which involves water. There are two billion people who lack access to safely managed drinking water. Three billion people who are currently facing water stress or water shortages. And four billion people, half of humanity, that lacks access to safely managed sanitation. Also, over the course of the past 20 years, we've seen that the overwhelming majority of natural disasters involve water, whether that are, whether those are floods, hurricanes, or increasing droughts, all connected to the climate emergency. In terms of environmental injustices, we live in a world where the global economy is based on the exploitation of people and the exploitation of nature, including aquatic ecosystems. And I've already mentioned the billions of people who lack access to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation, but on a more, uh, and I must say, the majority of those people do live in low income nations in Africa, in Asia, and it is fundamentally important that governments there find the human, financial, and institutional resources necessary to fulfill their human rights obligations and to deliver those fundamental services to their people. But environmental injustices happen everywhere. We had the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, in the United States, one of the richest countries in the world, where a predominantly black population was subjected to horrific lead poisoning because of decisions made in an effort to save money by the local government. In Canada, there are still dozens of indigenous communities that lack access to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation. In Guadeloupe and Martinique, the groundwater is horrifically contaminated with pesticides that are very difficult to remove. And so the majority of people in those French protectorates of Guadeloupe and Martinique lack access to safe drinking water. These are environmental injustices, situations where people in vulnerable or marginalized situations are disproportionately affected by these environmental challenges facing the, waters, facing the water system. Global water use continues to change. As the human population approaches 8 billion people, water use continues to rise. Humanity now uh, appropriates approximately half of all of the fresh water flows on earth for our uses. The overwhelming majority is used for agriculture, but I think it's also really important 
to highlight the inequalities and inequities in water use. People living in wealthy countries in the global north use an immense amount of water. And often that water use is disguised somewhat by the fact that many of the items consumed by wealthy consumers are actually produced or grown in the global south or in middle income and low income countries. So for example, in Switzerland, over 80% of an individual's water footprint, the total amount of water used to support their consumption habits, 80% of that water comes from outside Switzerland. Used uh, Water being used in some cases in countries where there's high levels of hunger, high levels of drought, but that water is being used to produce agricultural commodities for, that are then exported to Switzerland. A really critical piece of the puzzle is the fact that because human rights law creates legally binding obligations on states, this is why human rights are so important to addressing the water crisis. Because states have obligations, not just policy options, but legally binding obligations. States have to uh, monitor the use of water. They have to ensure that their legislative frameworks take a rights-based approach and prioritize the allocation of water to fulfill basic human needs. They have to ensure that all of their legislation and their plans take a rights-based approach to water management. Those are things including drinking water management plans, integrated water management plans, watershed management plans. They also have to ensure that those plans and the associated regulations are implemented and enforced and states must also evaluate progress and where necessary take steps to improve progress. And at each of these five steps that I've mentioned, there's two additional obligations on states. One is to engage the public to ensure that the public and all members of the public have access to relevant information about water to ensure that all of the members of the public have the ability to participate in decision making about water supplies and that people have access to justice with effective remedies when their rights to water, sanitation and a clean, healthy and sustainable environment are being threatened or violated. And the, the other state obligation is to ensure that there is adequate human, financial and institutional capacity to implement the regulations and the plans that the state has developed. And the good news is that we have solutions to these challenges. We have solutions to ensure people's rights to a safe drinking water, to adequate sanitation, and to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. I've already talked about the obligations that states face, but there are all kinds of good practices which have been chronicled in my reports and the reports of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Water and Sanitation. Things like um, pro-poverty water tariffs, where everyone who pays for their water pays a slight increment that is then used to subsidize the water supply for those who couldn't otherwise afford it. Another good practice which I really appreciate is uh, comes from Brazil, from from Bolivia, sorry, where uh, indigenous communities uh, upstream in watersheds are actually paid again by the use of a modest increment on people's water bills, those upstream indigenous communities are paid to take care of the watersheds, that is to protect water quality. This is actually a, a cheaper solution than investing in the expensive technology to, uh, to clean, filter and treat water. Similarly, in the state of New York, uh, to reduce water treatment costs, they have acquired at a cost of billions of dollars land in the watershed that provides drinking water to the state to the city of New York and again that has been a cheaper solution. Giving people voices, uh, engaging people in the decision making about water uh, and water related solutions critically important. Uh, solutions in agriculture include dr more drought resistant drought tolerant crops, more uh, efficient forms of irrigation such as drip irrigation, and then we have the whole range of possibilities from low, low flow fixtures, low flow shower heads, low flow toilets, to uh, in some countries where water is really scarce, uh, we can now recycle wastewater 
and use it for a variety of purposes. So these solutions exist. It's really a matter of implementation. And as I said, the beauty of taking a rights-based approach to the global water crisis is that it empowers people to hold governments and businesses accountable to their obligations and responsibilities. Ladies and gentlemen, water makes up 70% of the human body, 85% of the human brain. It's absolutely critical to human survival. And so it's incumbent upon us to do a better job of taking care of this vital source of natural wealth and human well-being. Thank you very much.